already. We start to record. Okay. Well, anyway, we do we do pro there will be post production work and I have extra okay. questions. So that, yeah, should I put on some kind of background? Yeah, yeah. If you want, so I put my background. Yeah. Okay. Hold I put on. the background this because imagine is... that that my office is not uh, as tidy as this one. Yeah. Um, no, that's fair enough because yeah. in fact, yeah, I'll, I'll live in this place. Yeah, but it, it was blurred. Okay, so the background was blurred. Mm. Alors, uh, right. uh, Lisa, thank you very much for for meeting, uh, uh, for meeting me. Okay, it's, it's a great honor uh, to meet you. As I told you, uh, the first time I heard about uh, about you was when uh, you had an interview with uh, with Lon with uh, Naomi O'Donnell, who was uh, interviewing for London Business School. Okay, and that's where I heard about you. And of course, she gave me your name, and I checked your name. And of course, I was very impressed by uh, by you, by your achievement, etc. So, uh, can you introduce yourself, maybe, uh, to uh, to our students? Sure. Um, so, my name is Lisa Duke. Um, I am myself an MBA graduate from the London Business School. Uh, for the past uh, more than twenty years, I have really been involved in all aspects. Uh, in fact, of both degree education and executive education. Um, that's right from designing um, degree programs such as the Masters in Management program at London Business School and also inputting into the, the most recent one at uh, INSEAD. Um, I also develop programs. I do a lot of uh, digital and virtual delivery and I'm a prolific case writer. Over the past 12 years I've written more than 100 cases. Yeah, which is, so, which is uh, impressive, which is impressive. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Alors, alors, basically, that, that's uh, where the idea came to, to contact you because from what I understood from your website, from your LinkedIn, but, uh, I understood that you were involved in, uh, in business education, but I didn't know that you were such a, such a high level, such an outstanding person, okay? Uh, and I wanted to ask you, but first I wanted to congratulate you for the last award that you have won. So, uh, where, this, where did this idea come from? A day uh, writing a uh, business case. Where did it come from? Uh, can you tell me? One on draw. So, yeah. So um, the the way it typically works is that uh, a professor will, you know, either come across, uh, you know, someone that has a story, yeah. or sometimes we. Uh, at the moment, I'm kind of uh, working with the professor, and we're just discussing. Um, he, he's developing a, a course, uh, an elective course at his institution on uh, uh, radical innovation, but sustainable radical innovation. So it's all about sustainability. So sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll kind of brainstorm together. Um, I typically always write for faculty because if you want to be published in one of the case centres, it's either Harvard or the European Case Centre, um, you actually have to write with faculty. So um, I'm always uh, the, you know, I, I am the author um, with the faculty, and that's typically how how it works. But um, you know, it depends. It, there's there's trends. Um, as I said interesting stories. Uh, sometimes we write what we call in company cases. So we're actually the, the one that I won the uh, the EFMD award for. That was uh, working with Barry Calabar, a, a very large. Uh, chocolate grinder that uh, cocoa grinder that no one's ever heard of but is in most of the chocolates uh, people eat um other times it's public sources it, it very much depends but always with uh, i should point out it's always with uh, a learning point um not okay. just an interesting story okay yeah, of course i i see what what the uh, business cases mm -hmm. are about okay so the last business case was about what and according to you why did it win an award? What was so so outstanding in this business case that it won an award? So I think the the so the Barry Calabar case for Ever Chocolate, uh, I I think won won the award, although um, they don't really tell you uh, ex exactly. Um, mainly, um, first of all, it, it it's about sustainability. It's about systemic change uh, across uh, an industry. It involves many stakeholders. Um, governments, uh, farmers, uh, consumers. Um, it's, it's a really in depth, it's a very data, data rich case. Um, we actually, you know, interviewed, in fact, uh, myself and the professor, we even went to uh, the uh, Ivory Coast to, to experience it firsthand. I mean, that case, I should tell you, it, it took about a year to, to come together. 
um, what with the visit and several interviews, um, and then of course the writing process. In fact, uh, there, there's actually um, more than one case that came out of it. Uh, there's also a compact case, uh, but but the larger case won, won the award. In fact, uh, it, there's so much material I could have almost written a book, but uh, you have to keep it small enough that people want to read it. Okay. So so basically, tell me. So so you Lisa, so you're currently. Uh, in, in engage inverted comma into a DBA with mm -hmm. Bocconi University, but you don't want to be a professor, so you want to still uh, remain a high caliber consultant in the education sector and uh, a, a case writer. Am I right, or you want to evolve into? So uh, I mean, uh, I, well, I mean, it would be very course. nice to be able to teach, but um, yeah. you know, I think uh, it, it's uh, certainly uh, at my age, it's it's not about um, you know, it, it, it's it's shall we say. Uh, becoming a, a gig for this moment. So an adjunct, it wouldn't be about having tenure because, uh, you know, for tenure, you have to be a lot younger. But um, I, I don't mind. I mean, I'm still young, I wish. Um, yeah. No, I mean, people, people, people typically know me as a program designer yeah. and a case writer rather than a teacher, even though with all the cases that I've written, I could probably teach them. And in fact, sometimes when I work with professors, I tell them how they how they should teach it. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, life, life is uh, not quite over yet. So so who knows? I mean, I, I do typically work a lot more now with executive education participants um and and that's slightly different so uh we'll see we'll see i think is uh, how i would best describe it so basically I, I wish that you had been my professor because i'm sure that you have learned i would have learned uh, a lot from you mm. so tell me so for which school uh do you write uh typically for which school do you typically write uh business cases so um i typically write or uh, for three business schools. So first of all, clearly there's my alma mater, London Business School. Um, and I write particularly, um, should we say strategy cases and um, sometimes uh, sustainability cases and uh, let me see, entrepreneurship cases. I'm just trying to think. Um, then uh, INSEAD uh, is where I won my award. Um, and I work with a lot with uh, a particular professor um, on corporate sustainability, um, so CSR, um, mainly, but of course, clearly working with lots of other people, uh, do a lot of digital transformation, which is also uh, the theme of my uh, doctorate. Um, and then my other big client is IMD, and I write cases across the whole gamut from uh, digital transformation to strategy to leadership. Um, I, I, yeah, you name it basically. So basically, and you have uh, you have AMD. Alors basically, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the, the top three uh, target schools of our students are INSEAD, LBS, mm -hmm. and HEC. So, uh, and of course, the other reason why, uh, so I came to to know you, uh, and I came to be interested in your profile, because of course you have designed the uh, the, the LBS and my program. Okay, alors, mm. so can you tell me uh, the, the genetics of all that? So did it come? Uh, was it, uh, uh, so, uh, so tell me, tell me your story. We are eager to, so, to learn. <laughs> no, absolutely. So how that came about actually was, yeah. um, I mean, I, I've been kind of very much involved um, in, so I've been very much involved in perhaps the, we call it, so we say the, the alumni side, you know, building communities of uh, alumni who passed through what was then the MBA program and the um, post experience masters in finance program. And um, then I was working with the then Dean of uh, programs. And we looked across the whole gamut of the portfolio and, and also about how the dynamics of the market was changing. And very much at the time, um, we just, uh, most recently there'd been like Bologna, the Bologna um, initiative, which standardized degree programs, undergraduate for three years, and then a, a kind of a two year or one year masters. So we, we did feel that at that point, and of course, you know, these things are cyclical and uh, ever changing. Um, the, the biggest opportunity was really at masters in management, uh, so pre-experience level. So from doing that review, um, 
we then uh, I, I i then started to work uh you know had a big project and looking at the, writing the business case uh for the master management and it was it took a while uh, i mean I have to be honest and i think this is the case for most of the business top ranked business schools at the time um and still you you see less master management in uh the us for example um you know you you need to faculty also need to kind of, shall we say, adjust their perception because it is a different audience with a different set of expectations. Um, personally, I really love um, working with pre-experienced students. Uh, I love it when I work with uh, what I call young talent and the exec ed side. So, um, you know, to have, a, have actually that opportunity to develop that program for LBS was really great. Uh, and in fact, from that, um, I, I was then invited uh, by INSEAD to do pretty much the, the same in terms of developing the, the original business case. Um, it was just one part of what then became a, a longer journey for them. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really pleased that INSEAD now has, uh, has a master management program too. Yeah, they, they launched last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know that this program is already becoming an elite program. Huh? Uh, it's uh, it's probably the no, in our next ranking we rank it number one because it's mm. becoming the most selective, and the center ranking uh, takes into consideration the selectivity of the program. Mm. Uh, how how uh, alors basically how do you explain the the rapid success of uh, the LBS and IM program? Is it just due to LBS, the, the location as well, the, the attractivity of London? So I think that. Um First of all, when, when we designed the program, we always wanted it to be the best. I mean, there was, there, you know, this is a, you know, it's a top ranked school from an MBA perspective. Um, you know, you, you design the best possible program. I think certainly the location really helps. I mean, London's a very dynamic city. Uh, of course, at the time when I did my MBA, uh, LBS was known as a big finance school, but that's actually not strictly true. Um, you know, people worked into consulting, uh, most, in fact, MBA graduates and I'd say uh, master management graduates, you know, are very interested in digital first businesses. Um, so Amazon, Google, you know, Facebook. And, uh, you know, we, we, we try to make it very impactful. And of course, you know, it has to be said, having a really good career service definitely helps. Mm. Um, I mean, I always say when when uh, you know prospective candidates ask me, you know, when when you're thinking about schools, and I use the same logic when I thought about where I was going to do my DBA. Um, you know, the, the, there's a kind of saying amongst uh, business school professionals. You know, always get into the the best brand that will have you that you can afford. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it really is about getting, uh, you know, that that brand on your CV. And I would say also, you know, the, the strength of an alumni um, community. So for sure, LBS has that um, in, in spades, I would say, um, you know, it's a very it's a, always been a big international school with a very diverse uh, population and their alumni clubs of, you know across the world that keep that alive so tell me the, the question that I, I have because of course that's the question that our students have mm -hmm. it's the two-year versus the one-year program as you know the lbs mba is a two-year program instead it's a one-year program so you understand that basically they are mim as the same duration okay mm -hmm. uh, isn't it strange that you uh, offer a qualified professional uh, to your program so i have students who are 31 32 and will go to school for one year when maybe for two years in london when maybe one year may be enough okay and some some 10 years yeah. for one year that they wish that they could go back to work but of course they are <laughs> with lbs and uh and why one year uh, when it was uh, when it is an mim where people may need more uh, work experience not uh, more more teaching uh more learnings than uh than the others so why why has lbs opted for one year program was it because of market conditions okay you could say okay one year uh, you can attract more people definitely and of course it's a good decision or is it because there is an academic reason behind that so i think um i mean first of all you can finish the mba at london business school in 15 months so you can finish it 
earlier. And in fact, the master management, you can do a longer internship afterwards. So that can also extend it mm -hmm. a bit more. Um, I mean, it, it, it's kind of hard. It, it, I would say it depends what you want, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you want to, if, if you, it, it also depends on, on, should we say, what you've done before. So I think that, you know, if you've, if you've already done kind of business or science uh, degree and then you're going to do a master's in management, you know, one year is probably enough because actually work experience really kind of shapes you and it gives you know so so what you're doing in that degree is a found shall we say foundation you know get, getting you off to a, a strong foundational start um you know some people who perhaps don't know what they do uh, don't know what they want to do afterwards mm -hmm. would, would benefit from two years or or going into debt um i'd always thought once we started the master management that perhaps the the best because of course when we originally did this we thought that there's some idea of cannibalizing your MBA program mm. and in fact what we found is that um, there is shall we say less cannibalization than, than we presumed um, you know some some people do master in management they they then go off um, and then they find that actually they can't really go any further and then they need an MBA and so some will actually then go and do an MBA or some will go and do, uh, you know, like a, an executive MBA or a, or a global uh, executive MBA. And I think that, you know, those programs, I mean, pre, pre COVID, when you could travel, there are very, very attractive global executive MBA programs, that is for sure. So, you know, having that kind of masters in management and, and then, you know, something later, I think also, again, helps you develop. But again, it depends, it depends what you're looking for. Um, we, we felt that, um, at the time, a, a one-year master in management was was enough, and and we actually did quite a lot of um, research, talking to our uh, uh, the companies that recruit from LBS, and saying, you know, what what would you do? Um, you know, would do you think two years is is better? Is one year enough? And actually, they, they came back and said, no, you know, depending on who you're recruiting, one one year should be, far, you know, should be enough because then you become an analyst. And of course, you can become an analyst or previously you could, you know, straight from an undergraduate. So mm -hmm. there was this feeling that how much more did you want to study before you actually got some, you know, strong work experience? OK, there's also uh, another issue about the program structure that we have, Lisa. Is that, as you know, students have their job interviews in September, October. Okay. And usually, especially those who have uh, like a liberal arts background or social science, those who, who, are, who have not, uh, who don't have work ex much work experience or a uh, type of education that is not business related, they tell me that they struggle during the interview time in September, October, because they hardly start that they already have uh, job interviews and many uh, have difficulties with that. So uh, what would you advise these students to wait a year uh, before applying to, to LBS, a year after graduation or to? I mean, I, I think that, quite frankly, you can really benefit from getting some work experience and then mm -hmm. going in and doing a master's in management. Um, I, I know it's meant to be pre-experience, but nevertheless, there is I, I don't remember, and I do a lot of um, uh, interviewing for the master management, particularly for candidates in Switzerland, um, where I'm located. I, no one has zero work experience. Everyone has to have, you know, at least a couple of good internships. And I think that just to have, you know, some interesting experience on your CV, and it, it really helps. Um, you know, the, the problem nowadays is that there's so much choice that you almost don't know where to start. And if you can kind of, shall we say, you know, sp perhaps spend a year or six months experimenting with different things that might sound interesting, um, and then you go and do your master in management, you can really like hit the ground running. And it makes you, you know, you, you're, it, it is unfortunate that, uh, of course, clearly for you know consulting particularly they they want to start so early um i mean you know we, we spoke to them about that and of course they're not going to change their their recruiting cycle this is uh you know you're you're beholden to the customer and they're the customer mm -hmm. um but 
on on the other hand um i i would advise you know young people you know finish your undergraduate and then just don't jump straight in you know try and try and do something that's interesting or you know the ideal if you don't want to wait is to have some interesting internships during the summer but uh you know of course that's not always possible let me is that there's another, another issue that you mentioned cannibalization so yesterday I was talking to a student of ours who is at INSEAD and he told me that some of the students of his uh, master's in management are 26 years old and they have three years of work experience, okay, when he has a uh, non because he just jumped from, he's a graduate from the Bocconi. Uh, don't you think that is the danger that now, and we see that already in India, that students take a one-year program uh, at INSEAD especially even though they have three to four years of work experience, they are already eligible for an MBA uh, versus an MIM, okay? And uh, do, do you know about these trends that now they're developing at INSEAD and HEC? That they, are, they tend to take students who have three to four years of work experience in their MIM program. Do you think it's advisable? Um, I didn't know about that. And I can only say I would raise my eyebrows at it because this program was always designed for one to two years work experience. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, I personally find it a bit extraordinary that, that uh, you know, when, when we designed the London Business School program, that, you know, that was absolutely the cutoff. Um, now you might be a little older if you've done different things, but in terms of work experience, that's the maximum that you would have. Because otherwise, why not just go and do, as you said, why not just go and do an MBA? Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to me, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could answer your question, but it doesn't make yeah. sense. But I, I think, Lisa, that there are two reasons. Sometimes it's, uh, it's the duration. Sometimes they try to go into a one-year program, uh, even though instead it's also a one-year program, but uh, and also the price, it's a bit cheaper. Okay, so instead for 50,000 euros, so they may say it's a way for me to save uh, 20 or 30,000 euros out of yeah. this with basically a master's from the reputable school. So that, that's, that's, my, that's my feeling today. I so mean, it's more like the uh, recruiters who may be surprised to see a 26 years old out of uh, an MIM. That's, uh, well, I, and I think that that that's, is actually the point. Um, I, I mean, to, just to share an anecdote with you, you know, when I when I went to so so my checkered checkered career history um, early on is that I only went to university to do my undergraduate when I was 23, and I worked before that. Um, so when I graduated at the age of let's see, I think it was about 25, 26. Um, and then I I worked in banking, and then I went to LBS. Um, recruiters, uh, when I would try to get a, a job afterwards, the big recruiters, the big brand names said to me, oh, but you've only got a year experience. You know, I was 27. They said, you've got a year experience. And I said, no, I've got, you know, a lot more experience. Oh, but that was before your undergraduate. And they literally wrote me off. Now, I know this was like, you know, hundreds of years ago where and now today, you know, life is a bit more flexible and people are a bit more open. But, you know, nevertheless, they looked and they questioned and I found it very, very difficult. And I think that you have to, like everything, there is a game to be played here and you have to understand the rules and play that game as well as you can. So just because it feels like a cheaper option, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because, again, you have to think of yourself as a product. And therefore, you need to make sure that your product is as you know shiny as it can possibly be, with all the right bells and whistles, and not necessarily for the school, but for the career that you want afterwards. Um, because there, there is a, a definite, uh, you know, I, I don't want to call it. A, it's not really a production line, but you know, there is a process. You, you get into a good school, you go through, you do the things that make you, you know, shiny and and then you get a good job out the other end if that's your aspiration. Um, so you, you need to think about um, how, how you're doing this and, and what message you want to send to those recruiters. I mean, you see, it's a, it's a question that comes up, comes up a lot in, uh, in applications, but probably you have also uh, uh, reviewed that. 
uh, how do you think, how have you designed the LBS program, the LBS MIM program, so that it uh, change people, that uh, they can have, uh, they can make uh, greater impacts uh, in the organization they work with, and they will also uh, improve uh, becoming better product. What, what is there in it? So you already mentioned that the first LBS uh, offers a lot outside the classes, you know, the reputation, the city, the network. But how have you designed the program so that it changed people? What what do you want to change in them? What can they improve with the program? How have you engineered the program? Exactly. It's a difficult question. So I think but it, it is a difficult program, and, and I, it's difficult for me to answer because actually the program, as with all LBS degree programs, are regularly reviewed and changes are made. So, um, you know, from, from designing it, which was a good few years ago now, to the program that it is today, um, I would say it's very different. The essence is still there. But essentially, I think what you need, what, what you do when you design a master management program is that you, shall we say, open minds. Um, you know, when you go to an undergraduate program, you are being very much taught at. For the most part, you know, that's not to say there aren't there aren't projects and, and things like that that you, you do, but you are you are being a, a body of knowledge is coming at you and you absorb it. When you go to a master's in management program, you're taught, shall we say, a little more to think for yourself, to question, and, and mainly to also question your own um, uh, assumptions, you know, to become more open to the world and to not take things perhaps as black and white, which is not to say that you don't get that uh, critical thinking, you know, in an undergraduate degree, but there's, shall we say, perhaps more interaction and there's more interaction with faculty around this and, and working with others. And certainly, um, you know, given that most people would do an undergraduate degree, you know, in their locality and definitely in their country, um, you know, by going to a business school and doing a master's management program, you know, you're pretty much mixing with a hugely diverse um, body of students with very, very different life experience, a very, very different uh, approach to tackling problems, to thinking about challenges. And, and therefore, one of the biggest learnings actually takes place amongst your, the, your fellow students. And, and so building in elements of how you can do that, um, you know, whether it's through case studies, whether it's through group activities uh, and exercises, um, whether it's through developing skills, um, you know, or as you said, you know, doing the extracurricular activities of, of clubs and, you know, also career um, applications and career workshops. You know, all this makes you, I would say, fundamentally, you know, op open your mind to a different way of thinking. Okay. So there's another trend. I don't know if you're very really familiar with that, but now we, we publish uh, studies and we see very well that there's a direct link between your GMAT score and your chance of being accepted, okay, uh, at schools and more than what we believe, okay? Uh, usually when we talk to admission officers, they said the GMAT is one of the things, you know, we perfectly see that if you get 780, you have much more chance of getting in than if you have a 740, much more chance than a 700. So basically the higher the score, the higher the chance of getting in. Uh, I guess that when you took, when you entered in LBS, it was probably a different story at that time, okay? What do you think about this, probably, huh? uh, mm. uh, so what do you think about this, uh, me, when I say to send my first GMAT student at my first MBA student at LBS, their score was 640. Uh, today, uh, it would be impossible to get LBS with a 640, whether it be an MFA, whatever. Uh, how do you use that from the outside? You, you're an educator, Lisa, so you're, you're a researcher, you do your DBA, you're an educator, you're a case, uh, case writer. How do you see this, this uh, GMAT inflation? How do you understand that from, from uh, from your own point of view? So I, I have my own opinion. Yeah, you can tell. I, which, yeah. which, I mean, I, I personally find any of these standardized scores a, a bit of a joke. Um, mm. I mean, and, and yes, when I went to LBS in 1993, so a really long time ago, life was very different. 
um, and they were looking for, shall we say, different things. I think the problem today is that, you know, and I would say this um, to any student, which is not to pour cold water over their dreams and ambitions, but you are part of a global market. And when you have a global market, um, and this is not my opinion, well, this is my opinion, mm -hmm. but I think also based on what I can see. When you have a global market, you know, it could be you or it could be someone sitting somewhere else. And it's very, very difficult for business schools to determine just by an application and even by an undergraduate degree, you know, do you want to take Mary or do you want to take Joe? And so there is regrettably, in and this is that's my opinion um you know a hurdle that you have to overcome to get into a top rank school and currently that hurdle is a high gmat um however unfair that may be it is a reality and therefore i would say you know with the best will in the world if you have the the resources and the time um, you know, you have to study for it. You have to prepare yourself as much as you can because you're absolutely right. You know, the correlation is the higher you get, the more likely it is you'll be able to get into a good school. And I say this also because in, in my, um, one of my daughters is trying to get into the UK to study medicine and there is a, a BMAT exam and the correlation is exactly that the higher score you get, the more likely it is you will get a place. However yeah, unfair true. that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, last, the last two questions that I have for you is that, as you know, uh, LBS since uh, 2010 has developed other uh, masters. So they have now a master's in BS analytics and an MFA, Master in Financial Analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, have you been involved in that? Do you think it makes sense for LBS to go into that direction? Uh, maybe a bachelor soon? What, what do you think? So I don't think LBS will ever go into bachelor education because it requires, first of all, probably a much larger faculty body. And there's also, and also faculty bandwidth. Um, it's a very, very different type of teaching. You know, when when you when you're teaching MBA students, executive MBA students, um, even pre -ex pre experienced students, they're they're adults. Undergraduate students are, you know, this may be the first time they've ever left home, and it it, it is a different a different way to teach. Um, so I don't think they're, in my opinion, they I doubt whether they would ever do that. Um, I mean, it, over the years, LBS has only really increased their pre-experience master's degree by uh, two or three programs. I don't think that they're going to suddenly have a wide portfolio of those programs, because at what point do you then really start to cannibalize your, your main offering, which has always been master's in management, um, e even though I, I do understand that, you know, other schools, are looking to you know have a have a portfolio of different masters but i mean i i don't as i said i you know I, this is this is entirely my opinion rather than you know anything official from the school but i i can't see it to myself um okay. so then the, the last question that i have for you is of course and it's directly linked to the the to, to the reason behind um, case studies that, as you know, uh, well, the case study was developed at Harvard in 1905. Uh, it was taken from uh, the, uh, the law school uh, when they were as looking for material. They said that how our uh, people taught uh, at other uh, departments of the, of, the, of the university and they found out that there was a, a great way of teaching, which was the case study, which is taken from the, from the law school. Uh, and of course, there was sold you that the case study, it's a way for you to uh, develop your um, your your um, your management skills, your business skills, because it's a way for you to apply the theory and that you are learning class. Um, as you know, it was criticized. Huh? Uh, I remember that uh, 
Dean Jackson, the, the former dean of uh, Rothman, criticized this approach. Uh, Wharton as well by saying we should put fewer case studies and more teaching. Okay. According to you, what is the right balance between between lecturing, uh, theoretical classes, and the case studies? And uh, do you see that the case study could could evolve into something uh, different? So, I mean, I, as a case writer, <laughs> I never um, like the idea, for example, of going to Harvard and just spending two years at an MBA, you know, reading like hundreds and thousands of really, really long 35 page case studies. Um, you know, I think those kind of case studies, uh, I, I can never really understand the point of them. And I have to say that today it's you'll be hard pushed to find such a long case study normally case studies are around five thousand words that's between eight to ten pages mm -hmm. um today they're also a lot more focused um i think to directly answer your question lbs for example it's never just been let's let's do a case study let's do another case study there's always been a strong balance between teaching theory and then using a case study that can illustrate that theory in uh, an applied way so when i write case studies now they're, they're very much in application and that's why you always start with a learning objective it's not just like oh that's an interesting story let's mm -hmm. write about that um in turn to to your other point about how they're evolving they definitely are evolving there's a lot more video content um i myself am just uh hopefully nearly finishing a case study that is shall we say uh, a lot more immersive um it has far less text and lots of photographs and video and slide decks um and it's a more of an immersive experience so that you're really getting um the readers to to walk in the footsteps in this case of an entrepreneur um i mean this is this is a bit it's i don't I think LBS and it's an LBS case study has actually done anything as immersive as this particular case study. It's really going to hopefully be a show showpiece, um, and I hope it's the beginning of, of something uh, more. Um, but I don't think case studies are necessarily ever going to go away because they do serve a very useful uh, learning objective. Um, you know, they're a way to get people to walk in other people's shoes. They're a way to shine a light on a set of issues and think about what would you do about that. They're a way to teach a framework in a much more interesting manner than just this is the framework and this is how you fill it in. Um, but, you know, filling in on a, in a real story. Um, but like everything, um, you know, the, the world moves on and so will case studies. Okay, last question, the future of business schools? Future business schools. I, I, I think this is, this is like an ongoing question. Yeah, yeah but in two, three points, you know. In, in two, uh, in two in three, three points. Um, future business schools, I think the, the top ranked schools will continue. Um, so, I, I, I think, sorry, <laughs> let me start yeah. again. I don't know who that was. Yeah. I think that the top ranked schools, um, you know, will continue to attract very high quality students because, you know, if nothing else, you, you go there for the brand and you go there for an alumni community. So it's a bit like joining a club. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's going to go away anymore, uh, you know, very anytime soon. Um, for the, the lower ones, I think they might still struggle, but they'll find a niche. Um, I think business education will hopefully, shall we say, become kinder and, and really tackle, you know, major trends. So hopefully it won't just be, uh, you know, focused on I, I go, I know I pay lots of money and I expect to have a really huge salary out the other end. Um, but perhaps I can say that because I'm old. <laughs> but I, I, I think that they won't go away anytime soon. That's my key point. Um, okay. They they serve a purpose, and I think that they do it quite well. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. So, for information, we'll be back in uh, in Lausanne on the 17th because we organize a, a big event with HEC, Imperial College Business School, and uh, ESSEC. 
and the event will be for EHL, uh, EPFL, and HEC Lausanne students. Uh, I will send you an invite if you want. So it will be a webinar, but if you want to just uh, stop by to see what we are doing. And because in these universities, we teach the GMAT and we train people so that they go to uh, about HEC, uh, INSEAD, and, and LBS, and if not, uh, others that are equally good. So it was, of course, very nice to, to talk to you. Uh, and uh, I'm always impressed when I see you to see the the, the precision of your answers and uh, how knowledgeable you are about all this. And it's, of course, very good to talk from someone who is behind the scene and uh, let our students understand better what is going on behind the scene. Thank you very much, Lisa. Oh, thank thank you. you. It's my pleasure. Nice thank to you. talk thank to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.